I would like to introduce Jeff. Uh, he has, for over 20 years, uh, worked in public television and as on-camera talent writer and documentary producer. Currently, he's the president of Caldera Productions, an independent documentary film company that tells the stories rooted in the American West. His productions have won a variety of prizes, including the Heartland Emmy nomination for the State of Quality, uh, Barrett Town, the Heartland Emmy Award for Best Documentary, Will Rogers, and American Politics and the National Educational Television Association top prize for documentary, Ellen K. Simpson, Nothing Else Matters. Jeff is also the author of several books, one of which you can see in Clearwater uh, is about the Wind Re River Indian Reservation and won the Spur Award for Best Nonfiction from the Western Writers of America. He's the former editor of High Country News and has published many national publications. Home From School is Jeff's third feature documentary that he has directed with Kadera Productions. Excuse me. Jeff splits his time between Lander, I probably butchered that, Wyoming, and Bel Air, Maryland. I want to thank uh, you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to try to be very brief for two reasons. One is we want to get to the film. And the other is you guys are really here to listen to the three panelists that are with me, uh, who are the folks who lived the experience that we're going to describe in the film. Very briefly then, Home From School, it's the story of really an unrelenting quest by the Northern Arapaho tribe to retrieve the remains, the remains of three boys from the tribe who had been shipped off in the late 19th century to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School from their home on the Wind River Indian Reservation. That's like a 2,000 mile journey long before there were airplanes flying back and forth. These boys would pass away. They would die at Carlisle and were buried there in 1883. What you're gonna see is the opening of the film, which we'll call a work in progress because it's literally in the midst of edit. It's changed since the last pre-screening we did just a few days ago. Uh, we're still editing, but we're nearing the finish. This excerpt's gonna run about 20 minutes. It's really the beginning of the film. Then we have these wonderful folks from Wind River who've been involved in this story for a lot longer than we've been working on the film. I'm gonna name them now, but then give you much more information when we come back from the film. Yufna Soldierwolf, Crystal Seabaring, Jordan Dresser, not quite on camera there, but he's with us. Anyway, let's have a look. Then when we come back, I will introduce the panelists and we'll talk and I hope you'll have questions. Okay, just give me a second while I get it up and running. Hello everyone. Are we back? We are back. So first of all, I wanna say hi to my, my friends out at Wind River who are in a place I wish I was right now. I'm stuck on the East Coast. But uh, um, you've seen, uh, for those viewers, you've seen about 20 minutes of the documentary, still in the midst of edit. Um, in, a, in a way, it gets off into the larger story of Carlisle and the boarding schools, and will come very much back onto the story of the quest of the people from Wind River Indian Reservation, particularly the Northern Arapaho tribe, to bring the, the remains of three of their children back to the reservation. Um, let me very quickly introduce the panel, and then they're the ones we're here to listen to and talk to. Uh, first, Yufna Soldierwolf. You have seen Yufna in the film. She's a member of the Northern Arapaho Nation on the Wind River Indian Reservation. She was formerly the director of the Northern Arapaho Tribal Historic Preservation Office, which you'll hear again. She's the great, great, the great granddaughter of the Northern Arapaho's last war chief, Sharpnose, and her great grandmother, Sweetgrass. Yufna. Thank you, and great to see you. Crystal Seabaring is the Deputy Director of the Northern Arapaho Tribal Historic Preservation Office. She has degrees from the University of Wyoming in History, American Indian Studies, and Environment and Natural Resources, and she is an enrolled member of the Northern Arapaho Tribe. Crystal, good to see you. And then Jordan Dresser. Well, he's a documentary producer. I can't, I can't, uh, he should be monitoring this as much as I should. He's the collections manager as well for the Northern Arapaho Tribal Historic Preservation Office. He's a, he is a producer of Home From School along with me, but he has earlier credits on the documentary, What Was Ours, and is also at work on a new production about missing indigenous women. And he is a member of the Northern Arapaho Tribe. Great to see you, Jordan. So I hope you, um, Guys can put your mics on because you're gonna be the ones that are gonna do the talking here. Um, 
I will mention very quickly, though, a couple of other contributors. Sophie Barksdale is another producer on this project who's not with this part of this program. And secondly, Jared Tate, classical composer. Uh, he's a, a member of the Chickasaw tribe from Oklahoma, and he's responsible for much of the music on the soundtrack. Um, we should probably start right off by thanking the Carlisle Journeys group for putting this together at a very difficult time to stage conferences and get people together. So. Kara and all of you, thank you so much at the Cumberland County Historical Society. So let's get to the questions. Let's get to some conversation with our panelists. I don't want to give away the drama. There's a, an hour long documentary, um, much of it still to come and hasn't been seen, but we can at least say that this story of trying to retrieve the remains of these children and bring them home was not an easy path. And I think um, we can talk about some of the impediments and setbacks and errors, some of the pitfalls, Really, the big question, and I think we'll start with you, Yufna, is what kept you going? Because the effort goes back generations. So <clears throat> I, I, what kept me going was probably just knowing each hoop they had, had us jumping through, we'd make it through and then get to the next one and then have another challenge or obstacle and then have to jump through that one. And pretty soon it got to the point of like, okay, we made it this far, how much further can we go? So I think just setting goals and phases and making sure you have a team that's working together was really helpful. But just, just kind of pacing ourselves and reminding ourselves this is gonna happen. We just need to go through the, you know, all the obstacles and challenges we were getting. And I think of some of the rebuff that you got from various, various places, certainly from the US Army. I've, I've seen the letter where they said, well, we've got problems with your proposal. This is part of our community. It's a historic site and a beautiful tribute to the Native American people. That's a way of saying no. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, the first letter I've ever written, written to them, the general, I have forgotten his name, but he had said, um, this is a beautiful place. We don't want it, we want it unbothered you know, all of this other stuff and um, kind of talked about how he was part Native American and he could sympathize with us. But at the same time, I felt like, no, I don't think you really understand what, what we're wanting. So yeah, the, the, that first letter was really important. And then, and then there was a kind of a breakthrough and uh, a delegation of elders, young people, and folks from your office went back to Carlisle and Jordan, you were part of that delegation, part of that trip. Why don't you talk a little bit about what it was like and, and what you went through when you got there? Um, you know, Carlisle is a very interesting place for multiple reasons, but the biggest one is just that it's um, a very heavy spot, you know, and being able to be a part of that was difficult on multiple levels because, you know, one, I'm helping the film aspect but also the tribal member you know these are these are my people as well so it's just like it's it's you're trying to capture the moments but also you're trying to feel the moments so i think those are like the two difficult things and um i just really admire everyone who went on the both trips because it's it's a heavy place and it's um intense to experience all that and you mentioned both trips and of course that's part of the complication of the story, part of what makes the story interesting. Uh, even when you appeared to have succeeded, things weren't entirely successful. There had to be another trip back. Crystal, I think that was your first trip back, that, that second trip to Carlisle. What, what are your memories of that and what, what did it feel like to be there? Yeah, um, I went on the second trip and um, I was just starting uh, my first year of working here in the office with the TIPO program and growing up I, I've always heard about boarding schools and I never got um, the knowledge or taught about our own children that were buried there and I didn't really start hearing until you know later in life about these children and I thought it was really important and that, that was one of the things that drew me to the office was uh, the the efforts that were being conducted to bring our children home. And um, the first trip I didn't partake in, but the second trip I did due to um, some other uh, 
elders not being able to go. And for me, it was just a really, um, really harsh reality into looking at, around and seeing what these children experience, you know, being young. And I'm, I'm like, almost, I, I was around 40 years old at the time. <laughs> and um, just for me to have that feeling of being so alone there, and then to have that feeling of a small five-year-old being there and feeling so alone, you know, and that just blew my mind. I just couldn't believe um, what they went through. Do we wanna talk a little bit about the, the elders who were a key part of this, both in terms of the decision-making, getting the trip underway, and, and in the documentary, uh, later in the documentary, we'll see a great deal of them. But of course, for them, it had to be an even more complicated and, and uh, painful journey. One of the things that I was very aware of was how the young people were assigned to and took care of the elders. And I guess uh, I'd love to have any of you, I'll let you, you volunteer who would like to speak about that. Oh, you're all gonna be shy. Yufna, why don't you start? Uh, you're muted, Yufna. I think you're still muted. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so what had happened was, um, you know, the elders that went this to the actual trip um, were other elders who had already passed on generations. You know, we talked about this is a generation type of movement. Um, but the elders before that had never been able to actually see this actually happen have already passed on. So, you know, these elders that were there were finally like, um, I used to grow up to thinking, um, when are we going to go to Carlisle? And they were like, we're not going to go visit until we get our kids. And that was like that final stay because I wanted to go visit it. And so they said, eventually, all of the elders were like, I'd have meetings with them and they were like, okay, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Um, and so for the youth, they, they had um, jumped on and Millie and their group were like, we want to take some youth. And I was like, that, that, that would be great. And the best part that I remember, like you said, they, the youth were just taking care of the elders. And one of the things I liked was they were pushing them through the airport so we could get to the next gate. And it was crazy, it was hectic, where we everybody was trying to get wherever. But, you know, it was great because they had the wisdom and the kids had the energy to, you know, follow through with it. So it really worked out. So the, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I was trying to put it on you. Well, I just I think we can talk a little bit a little bit further about that too. It's it's a complicated business to uh, do something like this, both in in a ceremonial sense in terms of tradition, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that because that's something I think the young people on the trip had to learn. Um, the way elders feel and deal with uh, an issue like this is is quite complicated. So, um, you know, our, our elders are very traditional people. Uh, they still follow protocols. They still follow certain things that you're supposed to do. Um, and so that's the way we conducted ourselves throughout this trip. And so, um, you know, the logistics of putting elders with their feathers and their, their beadwork and their sacred items on a, the airplane was the issue. Um, getting them there, doing the things that they needed to do, hoping we have the things that we needed to do with were, were available and they were there. Um, so, you know, the, the youth got to see how that worked out. And at the same time, it was like a learning experience for them. Um, but for our elders, you know, everything had to be, you know, the way they, the way they would if it was happening here. So I had to run and make sure that the army understood what we were requesting. And for an example, we asked, um, can we make a fire? And they had, they, the army thought we wanted to build a bonfire. And we were like, no, we just need a small fire. So, um, you know, those, those, those stories and ideas of who Native Americans are in that area are still there, those stereotypes. So when we got there, we were basically still going working with them from the bottom and trying to, um, you know, work together to teach them who we were. And at the same time, it was like this huge learning experience for the youth. So 
in the end, logistically, I wasn't going to bed till like one o'clock in the morning because the army were banging on my door like, hey, you know, we still need to do stuff. And I'm like, I'm tired, you know, so it was a lot of work. And, and let's talk a little bit about why, why this was important, why getting these children back and bringing them to Wind River, which again is controversial, I think, to disturb a, a buried person, a, a, the remains. Um, Jordan, what, what is the good of it? What's the point of it? I think that the good of it is that we're reclaiming all the things that were taken from us in the past. You know, and it's, if you think about it, all of this stuff speaks about racism, you know, um, Carl out in school, you know, no matter what, it, it was racist to do what they did, you know, to take items from us in museums, that's racism. These are all just racism mechanisms. And to me, it's just us undoing them. And to me, that's the only way we can thrive is if we take back the things that were taken from us and we build a new and I think that the biggest thing that we showed people is that this is the power of sovereignty. And I feel like um, it opened up doors for other tribes to do this as well. And I hope it opens up doors for more tribes to do that, and not only here, but across the nation, whether it be Haskell or other institutions that have um, kids there. You know, I think those are the doors for us to do that. And I think it just speaks about healing in the end. And you touched on something there that we probably ought to mention, which is that, you know, it's, it's really significant and important to bring back these remains. But in fact, there's this vast amount of stuff and not just remains, but also artifacts, tribal heirlooms, things like that, that have, for various reasons ended up in the hands of non-Indians far away from wherever they originated. And Crystal, that's really something your office works with. Talk a little bit about how big a quest this is beyond just the children at Carlisle. Yeah, and um, it is a huge task that we have to take on. And, um, but it's really needed because like you said, um, Jordan stated, it's, it's a way that we can heal as a community and as a people, is that all these things that were taken from these children, um, from graves, from, you know, burials and um, that, have ended up in museums or at universities um, that we even see when we were in, actually in Pennsylvania um, at a museum that we we saw things there that um, pretty sure they were taken from the children at that time. And so just that passion of wanting to bring those home too and going through the logistics of that with NAGPRA and, 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 and jumping through those hoops next is um, another huge task, but like Jordan stated, like tribal sovereignty, you know, we, we can do it, we're gonna do it. And, um, you know, if we keep working together and having that same goal of trying to bring those back to heal our community, to bring our ancestors home, to let them rest finally, you know, and, and um, it's a lifetime work. It's a lifetime work and um, it's something that I'm very honored to be a part of. And um, I feel like so is Jordan and Yufna, you know, and they probably are the same like me where they go to bed at night thinking of all these things that we need to do. You know, it's a huge list, but I think we have the heart and the passion to do it. So I want to just make a quick mention to the audience out there. Um, we're all working remotely at this point. We're all virtual in a sense. But uh, I think these panelists are more than ready to answer any questions that you have, uh, whether it's inspired by the film or something outside of that that you want to ask, please uh, get us your questions and we will ask them on the air while we're here. Uh, I want to talk about one other um, aspect of how, what it means to actually bring this story out and tell it. And that is that if you, you all are, are well educated, you've been through education at a lot of different levels, my guess is that if you went to a public school classroom in Wyoming or many other places as well, uh, the story of Indian boarding schools, it would probably be left out of, um, of the history as it's told. Uh, is that the case? Can you talk a little bit about um, whether this story is kind of invisible 
and if that's going to change or is changing. Uh, we'll start with Jordan. You know, I think that um, what's exciting about this story is that it's the try tell on the story, you know? And what I think the power of that is that I think that is going to educate not only the world about Carlisle, but it's going to educate tribal people. And we're going to get better. Like, I think once we know more about her history, we'll have a better idea of where we're going. And I think that this documentary can speak about how we have to pay attention to what goes on in the world around us. You know, especially since that this is basically going on right now. You know, you look at what's going on with the border down south, you know, kids being taken from their families, exact same things going on. And you got to question what's going to be the long term effects of those kids, you know, being away from them being in these areas. So it goes on now. And, and, and um, I think there's different parallels. You think about um, World War Two, you look what happened with the internment camps, you know, with Japanese Americans, you know, and it's the same concept, it's the same idea. And it's just like history is repeating itself over and over again. And sometimes I think we just have to like realize what goes on so that we can move forward and create a better future for all of us. What about in the schools? Crystal, you, you've got kids. Um, are they learning these stories? Are they learning them the right way? Um, um, so, <laughs> go ahead, Crystal. <laughs> oh. Did you say Yufna or Crystal? <laughs> I said both, but I'm not okay. in charge. You just talk when you want to talk. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, my kids, um, I'm I'm pretty satisfied uh, right now with the education on the history. Based on what I've learned in high school, I, when I was um, 20 years ago or so, that uh, <laughs> I didn't learn any of anything about this in high school and I went to a reservation school you know and um, nobody told me this until I got into college which is really surprising you know and, and now like my kids they're learning more about it like with what uh, you know we did in Carlisle and brought the children home you know and they talk about it and they learn the history about it um, even now when uh, in January we brought the headdress home you know, um, there was a lot of research on um, black coal and a, a lot of kids doing reports on them and asking questions and um, just wanting to learn that history and connect. And so I think it's it's a, the turning point where people are just starting to realize, hey, we're not even telling our kids our history. Like we, we need to bring back that oral history. We need to make them sit down. You know, we need to have them listen, you know, when the time's right and that so those can be passed on because when I was growing up, you know, because of boarding school effects and trauma and stuff like that, they didn't tell us. And so um, I think it's, it's getting better. It could be improved. And that's kind of one of the big goals for this office is to help educate our youth and um, to have those items back from museums so that they can learn. You know, they're the ones that need to learn that. And they're the, they're the priority they should be the ones that learn what those items are. Yufna, how, how aware are people of all ages on the Wind River Indian Reservation of the fact that these three remains have been reburied in a traditional way on the reservation? In other words, is, is that something that for a moment people were aware of and thinking about and then not anymore? Or is it something that will continue to kind of resonate I think maybe that it's um, something that happened and we're kind of like, okay, what's the next thing that's going to happen? Um, because we're so used to living in the present. <laughs> um, life is so fast. We're so, so used to what's the next thing we got to do. Um, which in contrast is the, going back to what Crystal and Jordan are talking about, we're so disenfranchised from Carlisle because like you said, we're 2000 miles away from there. And a lot of the kids barely know about Colorado. You know, they barely know about our ancestral territory, let alone Carlisle. 
And so when you talk about Carlisle, um, we're so disenfranchised from that area that it's hard to talk and to teach and tell about it because it's so far away. Um, so when you go back to talking about public public education and I, I the legislation that had been passed two years ago was on a, um, one of their little committees. And that was the thing, history is not being taught here in the state of Wyoming. And so neither is neither are our kids. My kids now learn about boarding school, but I learn by listening to my, seeing my aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas cry about it, you know. I wasn't taught about it in school. Um, so I'm hoping kind of that the tribe um, understands it's uh, still an issue today and that it, it's something we need to continue to grow and to learn about. And I'm hoping this film will help be that educational resource. I think we can talk too about an educational resource for other tribes because you guys have led the way in terms of going to Carlisle and retrieving remains. And one of our viewers uh, asks, what, what have you learned? What advice would you give to other people who wish to bring their ancestors back home from Carlisle or from other Indian boarding schools? Um, where will we start with that? Who wants to take the first? Crystal, I see you leaning forward. I was just trying to read. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things I just would talk to Yufna <laughs> because she has she has a lot of experience and sh and she she paved the way, you know. And this office paved the way, you know, way before I got here. And um, they had to knock down some big obstacles and some big hurdles. And I think they really. Um, could probably really help a tribe just get their ducks in a row before they start um, going to the army and then actually bringing, you know, um, a plan to them because I feel like the army is like, we're not going to do anything until you have a solid plan of how you're going to get them, how they're going to come back, what you're going to do. And um, I think Yuvna is a great resource for that, you know, with firsthand knowledge. And so, um, yeah, you've not take it away. <laughs> so I think if I were to tell someone to, if they were wanting to repatriate their children from Carlisle, I would say, if you have the ability to do it, um, follow through with it. And, you know, it's something that is, you'll, you'll benefit from as you realize going through the, that process, how important it is. Um, we've met other tribes while we were there, um, the time Crystal went, and they were really um, excited and, and grateful that we were there and we were still trying to get our other kid back because um, that was something we wanted. We, we were like, we're gonna get all three back. And I think learning from that has really it motivates you, it inspires you, and you think if I, you know, if we could do this, we can do, there's other things we can do. So Jordan, this, this extends to museums as well, and you have, well, you all do, but Jordan, I remember you were particularly having some very interesting experiences working to get repatriated artifacts and things from the Field Museum and some other museums locally, meaning in Wyoming and nationally. Talk a little bit about that. Again, our viewers are asking, about museums and the army, different places, uh, how you go about this? Well, the crazy thing is, is that like, um, you know, it all starts with the inventory list and it all starts with us asking for them back, you know? And if you think about it, that's such a crazy thing that we have to do. You know, we have to ask for them back. But it's just that and you have to stay persistent because they don't want to give them up. And like I said, you know, we've been working with the film museum for a while with different things. And it's just, some things just don't go the way we always want them to. And it's just, NAGPRA is something, it's a great law and I'm grateful we have it, but at the same time, it really needs to be fine tuned so that we can better get that teeth going. So when we do hit institutions that get difficult with us, we can say, well, there's a mechanism for you to be more willing to work with us as opposed, it's just like almost like a slap on the wrist they get, you know, it's nothing that's really substantial. And in the end, I think that it's just the fact that these items 
belong with us because we can utilize them. And most of all, that we can revive things that are lost to us. And I think that's something that we really need to work on. And um, I think to people, it's just like, you have to be persistent. That's the key thing. Let's, let's talk a little bit about education today. We, we touched on a little bit asking whether, in fact, the story of the boarding schools is being taught in public schools and in educational institutions. But I think the larger question would be how things have evolved from the time of Carlisle. There are still federal boarding schools funded by the Bureau of Indian Education. And I know a number of people um, on various reservations who take advantage of those schools, which are quite different from what Carlisle was. I'd like uh, any one of you who would like to, you undoubtedly have relatives, maybe family members who have um, experienced boarding schools in a, in a more modern era, but talk a little bit about that. Um, who would like to volunteer? <laughs> uh, I have to call on somebody, I don't know. Yufna, why don't you start? Mm, okay, so I actually, we were never allowed to go off to boarding schools, even the contemporary ones when we were like in high school. But our high school here, St. Stephen's Indian School, used to be a boarding school. Um, so educational wise, um, you know, it's still the same standards or whatnot, but just, um, you know, knowing that we do still send kids off to like Riverside or Chamawa or Flandreau and these schools are still open. Um, is actually kind of an opportunity for some of our kids to get away from the home and experience life outside the reservation and understand what it really takes to, you know, be away from your home and know what it, what life is really like. Um, reservation life and um, life off the reservation is entirely different. Um, so when they get to go off to school, it's something that a lot of them embrace and a lot of them do, you know, actually benefit from. Any of, anyone else like to add to that? Yeah, so um, like Yuvna, um, my, my parents, um, my dad went to boarding school in South Dakota. And um, when I, I wanted to, because some of my friends were going off to boarding school in high school, I thought it was like a cool thing. And when I mentioned it to my dad, he was just like, nope, you're not going. And so he was really against boarding schools. And, um, but, when you look at it, you know, for some of the conditions that our youth are in, you know, sometimes that's the best place now, you know, that it's improved so much. And then when you look at the past boarding schools, the actual boarding school south of it was not bad. It was the people who ran it and the people who did the abuse, you know, and people who were violent and, and, and did that to our, our children. The trauma side of it was the bad thing. You know, if, if it was set up like how it is today, where it allowed them to be productive, allowed them to be positive, you know, and allowed them to actually adapt and, and, and be, uh, learn those skills to be successful like today. Just think of how, you know, so advanced we would be right now with, our, with combining the American culture with our own culture and how successful we would have been if it wasn't beaten out of us, you know. And so, I mean, it's a big difference. And when, when I, where I went to what high school, um, the reason why that was built is because our community, our, my uncle especially, um, he didn't want our kids to go off reservation to school. And so they worked hard to build the Wami Indian High School and to get that going and built because they wanted to keep our kids here for that purpose, you know, and, and to be successful. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of um, boarding schools to me is just how you grew up with it, um, what you experienced and what your, your family experienced, and then how, how, how do you heal from that? And, you know, what, what, what can you benefit from it? You know, and it, to me, that's, that's the meaning of, you know, this can go anywhere. And, but it's really about educating the history of actually what happened and the trauma that is still being um, affected to our communities now and, and how the addictions and the violence and the abuse that come, 
from boarding schools. You know, it's still here. So that's a, that actually leads to a question that one of our one of our viewers has asked, and that is, what what changes you've seen in your community in the Wind River community since bringing the remains of these children home? And I think what we're really asking is, you know, this is this is viewed as Sonny Goggles said as a as a way of healing, as a way of, of, and I don't know if it's actually bringing the remains or if it has to do with telling the stories that were not told for so long. Uh, Jordan, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, has there been healing? Is it too soon to say? What would you say? I would say that people are learning more about these processes and people are learning more about what it takes to repatriate, you know? And I think that they're getting a better idea that this is a lot of work. And in terms of the healing part, I think we're at that start because we're having these difficult conversations, but most of all, we're recording them if you think, think about it, you know? So it's like, we're gonna have this written record. And like, I think we're, we're, we're those still at those beginning stages, you know, but this is the start that we needed. So I'm just really happy that we're like doing it and it's like moving along in a good way. We have we have some more questions that have come in. I want to ask a couple of them. One of them is is kind of interesting. It's a question uh, from someone on the outside, but someone who lives in the Carlisle area asking, what can people do to be helpful in this effort? And really the question is, what can white people do to be helpful in this effort? Uh, especially in the Carlisle, Pennsylvania area. But again, more broadly, what can we do, we who are not members of the tribes, to facilitate the healing and repatriation process? Um, really, it's, it's people asking for direction. Let's start with Yufna. So I think, um, I think to, to work with tribes, um, you really need to understand that um, to be an ally means to be respectful of their cultural needs and to understand that where they're coming from is not a very good place because they're bringing all of their trauma like Crystal was talking about and they're bringing all of this hurt, hurtfulness there and it's something they're trying to deal with and so you don't want to you know um, make it any worse by you know trying to say hey how do we how can we do this? You know, um, in the like in the movie, if I don't know if you've seen the part where Millie said, "We're here to save ourselves. We're, we're we've been waiting for someone to come help us. We need to help ourselves." And that's what the big message is: is we we waited and waited for 134 years to help bring these kids home. We had to step up to the plate and say, "We're going to do this." And um, for allies to say, "How can we help?" is great. You need to remember to come from a respectful place. Remember that we do have cultural values. We um, we really want that help, but different people may want it in different ways. Um, and that's how it worked out with the, the tribes repatriating different tribes. I told the army many times that just because the Arapaho want it this way doesn't mean the Lakota or the Blackfeet are gonna want it the same way. Each tribe is different and you need to respect that and you need to move forward in understanding that and then say, how can we help you? I hope that answers the question. I think there's an element of, um, of getting out of the way in this too. And I, I can say this as a filmmaker that Jordan said earlier that you know telling this story in the voice of the Arapaho people, uh, one of the things we learned early on was we didn't need a narrator. We didn't need to do this Ken Burns style because these folks who were experiencing it were going to tell the story and tell it in their own way. And that's certainly proven to be true. It's been um, really important and a learning experience. Um, what about uh, internationally? Um, you know, the United States had a lot of boarding schools and there's a lot of embedded grief and suffering among tribal members who's whose parents, grandparents, ancestors were involved in it. Uh, but this is true the world over too. Do you find yourself comparing what's happening in the United States to what's happening in other countries that similarly used education to try to assimilate and maybe eliminate indigenous people? Um, Crystal, do you wanna talk about that? I 
I'm probably pushing you guys into into your uh, not necessarily your comfort area. Jordan, you might have something to say on that too. Well, you look. We, oh, well, and and if you think about it, we don't have to go that much further. I mean, look up north, see what goes on in Canada. You know, the residential schools there. It's the same concept, the same idea, and I think that. Canada has been really pushing with the, if you think about it, a lot of really big movements have kind of seeps from there, including I don't know more and different things like that, um, where indigenous people are saying, hey, you know, like we have had enough. We want our history told, but we want most of all, we want, you know, an apology for the things that happen. And most of all, we want to be able to not only have an apology, but we also want to seat at the table so we can dictate how this healing looks like for us rather than everybody else trying to tell us what we need to feel and what we how we need to get over things you know that doesn't work and i think that that's opening up the door for us as well so it's just like this this thing where um you know in canada they call them residential schools but it's just how um we have all these parallels but i think this goes on across the world in different places and I think we just really need to um, learn from the mistakes that we make time and time again, but we just don't. We just keep um, the circle going in a sense. So it's time that we just say, hey, well, you know what? We need to stop and this is how we're gonna stop. And this is how we're gonna heal. I'm gonna read a question that's come in. Um, this is uh, because it's, it's lengthy and I want to get it exact. Greetings all, I appreciate the panelists for sharing their story of their ancestral heritage. As an African-American male educator in higher education, living 30 miles from Carmel, Carlisle, excuse me, your pain resonates with me after visiting several lynching memorials around the country. My question, in your quest to reclaim the remains of the children, is there any documented, documented information on how they died? Or is the focus primarily on reclaiming the ancestors and artifacts? Yufna, why don't we start with you? I know you did a lot of work ahead of time uh, learning about these children and what happened to them. Um, so when it came down to research, um, like I said, it, it went back to traditional knowledge, but it also went that back to um, basically research. <laughs> um, what had happened was, you know, um, a lot of tribes were upset because, okay, so we had a meeting and other tribes were there, and um, many many of the parents a long time ago had asked, how did our children pass away? Um, and so that kind of goes back to undocumented children. Um, we, were, we weren't that important, so they wouldn't say what we passed away from. Um, that was the biggest issue, and it really caused a lot of anger, and still probably does cause a lot of anger amongst tribal people who want to know and get to the bottom of how did this child pass away? Um, so when you look at it, um, a lot of what, what I'm hoping later on is in the future when other tribes do receive their children back, we were told that um, our elders didn't wanna do a DNA process. What we were gonna do is identify osteologically, um, meaning that we're gonna look at physical traits, be able to tell through um, various things, through um, the child's age, sex. And so that's what we went off of. Um, and that worked out pretty well for us. A lot of the elders don't are, are against DNA right now because of various reasons. Um, so when you talk about research, you really need to know about um, who has the information, where can you find this information, um, who still has that knowledge within a tribe. It'd be really hard for me to go work with a different tribe and to try to generate that because I don't know their history. I don't know who I would have to even start to talk to. So a lot of tribes already have that knowledge. It's just how to pull it together is where it's at. Um, I'm hoping that answers your question, but I mean, like we can go and talk about research for so long that we could sit here all night. <laughs> but um, basically when it comes down to it, when um, you talk about the kids passing away, nobody knows. I'm hoping in the future they do find out and there is a report saying, you know, a tribe did decide to find out what happened. Um, but a lot of the time it was loneliness, malnutrition, diseases, heartbreak, loneliness. Um, accidents happen too, you know, um, like Crystal had talked about too, there was abuse there. So 
you name it, it's probably happened there. You know, we talked a little bit about um, the fact that this is international in scope, that there are other countries, other colonial, uh, countries of colonial origin that treated indigenous people in similar ways. And I think there's lots of different ways to respond to that. Um, there has been legislation introduced. One of our viewers has sent in a note about this, proposing a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Indian boarding schools in the United States. What do you think of this kind of federal process of reconciliation? Of course, this is a case of the non-Indians trying to respond to their role in the treatment of Native Americans. Um, what do you think of this possible federal process of reconciliation? truth and storytelling. Um, who should we start with on that? Volunteers? Crystal? Yeah, so um, I did read about this um, recently. And um, what I think about the reconciliation, uh, recognizing it, is um, it's a long time coming, just an apology you know, from the federal government saying, we're sorry for doing this to your children. We're sorry, you know, um, what can we do to fix it? I mean, in the long run, I mean, there's so much they could do to fix it. <laughs> like give us our land back maybe. <laughs> but um, so anyway, uh, I think, it's a good step forward, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And there's so much more that in our treaties, you know, that need to be honored too, that, you know, it's a lot of work and, and just saying, oh, we're sorry for, for this happening, but you know, there has to be action behind it, you know, and our, our communities need to heal and um, there's, um, just the process of us healing is so complex with each family member and each tribe too because it's so um, different the way we all got treated. It's the same but it's different and so each tribe you'd have to reconcile with each tribe and you'd have to not just group us all into one thing because you know our stories are all different and we got, you know, um, we should be treated as a separate nation and we should be reconciled separately. So that's, those are big steps you're talking about. Here's a small step that's come up. I think one of the things that I heard elders say and others during the visits at Carlisle was that uh, the boarding history, the boarding school history had been kind of erased it was an army war college now. They talked about Jim Thorpe and not much else. There was some discussion of turning the farmhouse there into some kind of memorial or museum. And Jordan, you've got a degree in this field. I guess I'm curious to know, what do you think about that? Is that the useful thing? Is that a minor thing? Would you like to see it happen? Well, I believe that museums are really important because they're sites where we make um, important connections about our lives and the whole world and how we can relate to them you know I always the example I always give is that like um me as a somebody living here I'll probably most likely never visit certain countries so if I go to a museum and I see items from their place I can make a connection to there and I can draw parallels between my life and there. So I feel like it could be, but it's gonna to have to be a place where it tells everything, the good, the bad, and everything in between, or whatever they perceive as good and bad. I think it's just telling the whole stories. So therefore people who visit that museum can walk away with a better understanding about what happened there. And they can have developed empathy for each other. I think that's the biggest thing that museums can create is empathy for not only the people who we encounter before the world and why we make the choices that we do and why we feel the things that we feel. So I feel like that would be a good site for it, but it'd have to tell everything. It'd have to tell all of it. And the question is, are they ready to do that? I kind of doubt it, you know? And, um, but that's to me what a true museum does. 
So I think we may be running down on time here, but I thought of something a while ago that I thought I'd like to do and maybe close with here. And that would be, you know, the non-native media uh, portrays Indian country and reservation life and all kinds of things with their own rather narrow lens. Um, and I think give people an impression of it that maybe isn't at all what it is for people there. I remember on, uh, one of the young people on the, on the trip to Carlisle saying, they tried everything to get rid of us, we're still here. So I wanna give you an opportunity here at the end to paint your own picture of your people, your community, um, the resiliency there, um, whatever you would wanna say, um, but give you that chance uh, to let you um, tell us a little bit about your home. And I think we'll just go around uh, the circle here, starting with you, Ufta. So my people are strong. My people are resilient. My people are educated now. Um, right now we're going through a pandemic and we're surviving. Um, we went through diseases, um, chemical warfare when, you know, as early as the 1900s, maybe earlier. But we're here, we're resilient and we're, we're happy people. We survive and we're, we're doing the best we can for our families. Thanks. Crystal, would you like to say some things about home and community and what the real life of Wind River is? Yeah, um, I, I feel like, you know, home is where the heart is and it's, it's where our heart, you know, our heart lies. And um, there's nothing like our people, you know, and, and the love and the care that we have and the culture that we, we carry. Um, you know, it, it's, I'm very honored to be a raffle. I'm very honored to be, you know, an indigenous person and an indigenous woman at that. And um, I feel like with this film, that I hope, you know, America and even the world can recognize, you know, what was done at boarding schools. And hopefully that the education system here in America um, starts telling the other side of the story and they start listening to our narratives and they start including that because, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's an ugly side of history, but it's the truth. You know, it's also the truth. It happened. You know, we didn't make this up. You know, and, and this this really happened to our people, and it can't be ignored anymore because you know we're educated, and we have a voice now. Um, we've, you know, one thing my family always told me is that, you know, you get your education because you you learn how to beat the white man at his own game. And that's kind of um, what we were, we were told growing up. And, you know, education was like a huge thing for us. And so um, I just feel like we got to even that playing field and we got to get people to recognize, or even our own people, to learn our history, to, to reconnect to our values, to reconnect to our language. You know, and, and to take that back and be proud of who we are and have that identity of an Arapaho person. You know, to truly be a Arapaho and to truly live a Arapaho, you know, and, and that's my hope for, for our people in the future. Oh. Jordan, please. I think the big thing is just that we're, we've learned so many, so much things and we're just, making big steps and the big thing is like i think we're really ready to make bigger steps and i think we're really ready to test what does it mean to be sovereign and to me i just feel like we're like growing outside these boxes that this the reservations try to put us in and i think we're like expanding it and we're realizing that we're not that those are just imaginary lines and our sovereignty goes way beyond that and I just think we're ready to do it. And I think that's like, it's time. And there's so many people who 
are educated, but also have that warrior spirit and mentality to really take it further. And I just look back at all the people who helped make these things happen, you know, all our elders who went on the trips with us and all across the nation, you know, all the ones who um, guided us. It's like, we're, we're ready to carry that on. And I think it's, and I think the time's now. Okay, well, if I understand the time correctly, I think we are done with the panel at this point. I want to thank my panelists here. They've been wonderful. Yufna, Crystal, Jordan, I miss you guys. Wish I was back there with you right now. Uh, Kara, do you want to take it back? I should quickly do a, a big thank you to the Cumberland County Historical Society for having us here uh, remotely. I know there's one, when do you expect the film to come out or how can people access it? I know there's some um, updates in the chat, but if you wanted to speak to that quickly. Oh man, I, I know there are links that I should be able to pass right along. I'm terrible at this. Yeah, we have I think there ones there. Yeah. If you can find them, let me know. But anyway, the, the film, in terms of getting it done, we are in our, in our fine cut edit, which is kind of the last stage of editing. We've done last minute shoots, pickup shoots, um, trying to get the last elements we have. It's, it's quite hard to do it when you're not using a narrator, when you need all of your participants to be the voices that tell the story. But our aim right now is we would love to have a finished film at the end of October. And that's what we're striving towards. Uh, I'm stretching out a little bit, hoping that Kara, that you can find the link that I'm I need to try give. to add it. Um, I know um, th there's also a request if you want us to keep up to date or be added to a mailing list, um, you can add your email into the chat box uh, yeah. for anyone that wants to do that. And I will try to add the link now. This is the right one. And you can also search for it or Caldera Productions on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and uh, and on, uh, just on the internet, you can, you can put in Caldera Productions and it will come up. We have a website that has all the information on it. And I want to thank all of you for participating um, and dealing with technology and hopefully everything went pretty smoothly. Um, and we look forward to seeing the full film uh, when it's out. And thanks everyone so much. And thank everyone for turning in uh, and listening and being a participant this evening. <laughs>